Well, we're, we're right next to what's called Epiphany. Not a huge celebration. You don't get time off work. You probably don't have an Epiphany turkey in the oven. But it's a pretty cool event, actually. You know, you think, what else could we do? We had Christmas with all of its stuff, and we've celebrated New Year. But the awesome thing about being in the house of God and the household of God is that there's just constant themes that connect us to his promises. And epiphany is one. It just means revelation. Something that was hidden has come to light. And if you think about Christmas, how sad it would have been if only a group of shepherds would have known about the birth of Jesus. That would have been great, and the angels would have been in the sky, and a group of Jewish guys would have found out that the Lord has been faithful to his promises, and that's great. But then that would have been the end of it. I don't know all of us all that well to know if any of you have Jewish blood. Most of us are Gentiles, right? Most of us are outside of that kingdom of Israel. And so if the message of Jesus and Christmas was only for them, we wouldn't be here today. But the message of Epiphany and the wise men is that God's message, his love in Jesus, is for the world. And so he put a plan in place to to pull these, these very learned men out of the Middle East to come and worship Christ, because he wasn't just for Israel, but for the world. So I think we have slides for this today. I'm going to read the the message from Matthew chapter 2, and then we're going to think about hope for the day. So from Matthew 2, this is the message about God revealing, opening up, uh, showing to the world that his grace is for all. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem and Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who has been born King of the Jews? We saw his star in the east and have come to worship him. When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed and all Jerusalem with him. When he had called together all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Christ was to be born. And it's interesting that even though these guys were some who fought against Jesus later and called for his crucifixion, they knew the prophecy. They knew what the Old Testament had said about the coming of Jesus. We hear in verse 5, In Bethlehem, in Judea, they replied, For this is what the prophet has written. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you will come a ruler who will be shepherd of my people Israel. Then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and make a careful search for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me so that I too may go and worship him. After they had heard the king, they went on their way And the star they had seen in the east went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold, of incense, and of myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. That's the message of God's love being revealed, opened up uh, to the world. There's there's the image I have for what I want to experience in my life this year. It's really an image where we can replace the word with a lot of different things, but I love that image of the open door. I think it's an image for our ministry, too. We're going to think about that a little bit today. But let's start with thinking of New Year's resolutions. Raise your hand if you made a New Year's resolution. Okay. Who wants to share what their New Year's resolution was? Okay. What what was your New Year's resolution? Take one day at a time. Look for a blessing each day. God bless you on that journey. That sounds great. What do you hope to accomplish by that? Maybe change or addition or emphasis in your life. What do you hope comes out of that? Okay, a little more positive, a little more encouragement, a little bit more of a sense of purpose. Right on. Who else wants to share what their New Year's resolution is? Hey, good for you. That's a tough one, man. Right on. Three weeks? Okay, God bless you. Let, one day at a time, let me know how that goes. I bet there's a lot of folk like you. What do you hope to gain by that? I would a sense of health, life, 
<laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Other New Year's resolutions that anybody wants to share? That's it? Well, some of them are kind of private, right? What's the biggest New Year's resolution do you think Canadians made this past New Year's? And I'm not sure how they gathered this info, but I read it, so it's got to be true. <laughs> Exercise to what end? Certainly health, but to lose weight. Absolutely. Not me. I'm good. <laughs> yeah, okay, that one's there. That one's there in the back of my mind. It'd be good. Uh, what other New Year's resolutions do you think Canadians have made? Exercise is number one. Okay, money is a big one uh, for Canadians. Uh, look after their money better, get a better job, uh, deal with their, their money better, find a rich uncle who would like to give them money. I'm not sure what that resolution, how that's going to work. But they hope to have better security. What are some of the other hopes Canadians have for a new year? may not be a resolution as such, but our theme today is hope. What do you think Canadians hope happens? Hockey season, so hockey season starts. Yeah, I, I've given up hope on that one. Did they agree today? Oh, I wish I didn't care. But, I, <laughs> but to tell you the truth, I do. I do. Uh, Canadians hope that their families are healthy, so there's some hope around health. Right? Some desire around health could be quitting smoking or drinking less or exercising or getting to the doctor more or uh, that they just hope kind of even vaguely that their marriages will be healthy, their kids will be healthy, their grandkids. Health is a big part. Okay, so we're thinking about hope today. How would you define hope? Think about it for a second. I, I got some definitions that I'm going to share, but what would you, how would you define hope to someone. What's a hope? Any thoughts? The promise. the promise of something. So there's a bit of an expectation, a longing for, a reaching for something. Okay, that's good. Optimism, so something positive moving forward, kind of building. Great. Other thoughts on what hope can be? Out of your control, so it's dependent on something or someone else. Okay, that could be. Mm -hmm. Other thoughts on what hope could be at the back? That's pretty cool. So a light, like a little, a, a light spot in the midst of, of darkness. Yeah, that's a pretty neat image of, of hope. Well, hope is, yes, Anne. The light at the end of the tunnel is not a train, but is the way out of the tunnel. That sounds like desperation to me more than anything. Well, here's some thoughts about hope. Hope can be, it can be a noun. It can be something concrete. I have hope, right? So that can be a powerful thing, a, a powerful emotion in our lives. I have hope, uh, you know, a, a conviction that drives us. Uh, it can be used as a verb. Uh, we hope for an early spring, with very little rain and lots of sunshine. It could be something we anticipate. But it's certainly something powerful. When our hopes are kind of misplaced or, or in an odd direction, or unrealistic one, our hopes can be dashed. And we can be left feeling very brokenhearted and very frustrated, maybe disillusioned. It's interesting, when we look at the word hope in the Old and New Testament, we find like with a lot of words that we use in common day language, it, hope takes on a bit of a different, deeper meaning. Uh, hope really is a reliance in the scripture. Hope is a deep-seated trust, a, a trust that leads to a commitment, a, a trust that leads to a strength beyond the strength that we have in our lives, which I think is pretty interesting. When you look at the book of Psalms, Maybe do that this month. Uh, spend some time in the book of Psalms. It's the Old Testament people's hymn book. And it really comes out of the real life. People seeking to quit smoking, people looking to have a positive outview, uh, healthier lives, people wanting a stronger relationship with the Lord, people struggling in lots of ways. The Psalms just lay out the, the variety of human experience. And when we look at the Psalm writer, 
It's pretty amazing what he'll list. And I'm just going to use he. We don't know. Maybe some ladies wrote some psalms too. But here's one of the things we hear from the psalm writer. My enemies are all around me. I'm tossing and turning at night, thinking and worrying about whatever it is that's on his or her mind. I'm looking behind me at day after day, Lord, wondering who's going to stab me in the back this week. I continue to think day after day that I'm unsure who I can trust in my life. And now I've served you, Lord, and wondering why these things are in my life. The psalmist will say, you know, Lord, I worship you. I come and I worship you, but there's no change happening. Lord, I pray to you. I pour out my heart sometimes with groans, without even words. And Lord, you seem like you're silent. And the psalmist does a little fist shaking at God occasionally. It doesn't really even matter what psalm you turn to. Psalm 22, Psalm 27. There's a little bit of this frustration uh, that the psalm writer expresses. Are you busy, God? Have I offended you in some way that I haven't really gotten a hold of? Are you neglecting me? And here's some famous words we've heard from Jesus from the cross. They're in Psalm 22. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? So sometimes the psalm writer sounds like he's lost all hope. But what's so amazing to me, which is a great way for us to start the new year, and a great image to think about for our ministry, psalm writers being real, talking about his or her struggles, then like a, a spiritual litany, a, a, a spiritual revival at the end of some of these psalms, he says, you know, regardless of my state of mind, regardless of my plight, what, regardless of what I'm experiencing day and night, my hope is in you, Lord. And the congregation joins the psalm writer in singing, my hope is in you. How does that make sense? Why is that? Why can the psalm writer say, here's the real experience I'm having, but my hope is in you? Is that naive? Is it presumptuous? Is it just make-believe? Well, there's only one reason, only one, and that is because of God's promises. For the people of Israel, God said this through Abraham, I will be your God, you will be my people. I will create my relationship with you, my covenant with you, and it will last not just for a generation, not just for one calendar year, not just if you're getting it right, not just if you've been faithful to your New Year's resolutions or my commands. I will be your God forever, and you'll be my people, generation after generation, and through you, all the world will be blessed. It is a great and mighty promise. And it's the only reason God's people can have hope. That hope has come to your life. It's come to my life. On this first Sunday of 2013, there's an open door before us. It's called hope. It's called hope in Jesus Christ. For God didn't just give that promise that he would be a forgiving God to Israel. He didn't just give a promise that said, I'm going to form a covenant relationship, this, this lasting everlasting love with these people called Israel. He created Israel so that he could send his son and then draw people to Jesus. And Jesus is here through the message that our sins are forgiven by faith in him, that his love is for sure, that his leadership in our life is steady and firm and not even the gates of hell can prevail against him, and that all of his love and mercy are ours by childlike faith regardless, like the psalm writer, of what we'll experience in 2013. Now, I hope we, we experience some awesome, awesome stuff, that we have the healthiest year we've ever had before, and that our relationships are stronger and more loving and truthful and supportive, both within our families and friendships and within our church than they've ever been before. And I pray that there's a sense of prosperity within our life and that we're able to make ends meet and, and do good things for other people because God has given us the wherewithal. But I have no guarantee for you or me on any of those accounts. But what we do have is this open invitation day after day to go through that door that leads into hope, a reliance, a trust in God that he walks with us. Now here's the cool thing. 
What led the wise men to leave the Middle East, these sages, they were learned in astronomy and chemistry of their day, physics. Um, the people of the Middle East had some of the greatest libraries the world has ever seen. What led them literally to Bethlehem? Star. God did that. I don't know how he did that. He aligned some planets. He jostled some dudes while they were sleeping to go, hey, check out that star. Something important's happening. You need hope. You need a savior. I'm here for you. Come to Bethlehem. The spirit led them to go, let's pack our donkeys and mules and let's go. And they went. Awesome. What is the star now to draw people to Jesus? To draw people to that open door where Jesus says, walk through. Walk through into love and joy and peace and hope. Who is the star now? You can't say Jesus. I know Jesus is supposed to be the answer to every question. <laughs> this time it is not. Who is the star we are the star. St. Paul says in Ephesians, the church has been established to be a light unto the world. The church has been established to be the Bethlehem star, not because we're so awesome, but because hope is touching our life. And God goes, I want everyone to experience hope. I want everyone to know they can rely on me for mercy and grace and healing and hope. How sad it would be for us as a church in 2013 to celebrate the fact that you and I, through a re relationship with Christ, have walked through that door of hope, that we can rely on Christ and then just keep it to ourselves and just say, done our job. We've done everything God has called us to do. But God is saying, you're the Bethlehem star. Be the star. Have the things that you're involved in. Even though you struggle, even though you haven't gotten it all figured out, even though 2012 wasn't perfect and 2013 won't be, I have put hope and faith in your heart. Be the star. How do we become the star in our community for 2013? Whatever we want to do that draws attention to Jesus Christ. Whatever we want to do that will give an invitation to the community around us and the people in our lives and the people we work with and our fellow students at school to know that Jesus is the open door into the heart of God. Whatever it is, God gives us the freedom as long as it focuses on the love of God in Jesus Christ. There's a lot of hurting people in this room. There's a lot of us who struggle with a lot of different things. And yet, we have that message of hope that keeps touching our life, that, that keeps prodding us forward to keep walking through that door of hope in Christ. I thank God for that. That's why I want to raise my, my family and someday soon grandkids in a, in a church like this. We don't worry, we don't have any grandkids yet as far as I know. <laughs> Nobody's engaged as far as I know. Although, I'll tell you, we thought for sure one of our boys was going to let us know he was engaged at Christmas time, and when Christmas came and went and there was no announcement, you know what, you know what I did? Whew, all right. I'm not quite, I don't know, if maybe he's ready for that, but I'm not sure I'm ready for that. But that's the kind of church I want to see my grandkids eventually raised in a, a church where there's real people who are hurting, who keep encouraging one another to go through that door of love and hope in Jesus Christ. But we also need to be that light, that star that shines to our community. As imperfect as that will be, God will make it perfect and draw other hurting people because the hurting people aren't just in this room. They're in our community and in our lives. And so for me, this is an image that I want to carry with me. Maybe it's my resolution to keep this image at my forethought as a senior pastor here at Zion, to encourage one another, our groups, our ministries, our time together, our fellowship, our projects, our service, to go, okay, how's that connected to opening the door for people to to walk through as the Spirit leads them to find some healing for their hurt in Jesus' name. And I hope that and pray. I hope. I have confidence and conviction. It's not just a wish. I have conviction uh, that you'll join me in that and you'll join one another in looking for more and more ways to open the door to each other and to the world so that others can walk through too. It's awesome that we're in a new year. It's a time of possibility. It's a time of new hope. And all of that's grounded in Jesus Christ. It, 
is my greatest desire to continue to walk and journey with you as we grow in faith, hope, and love. And we know the greatest of these is love. Let's pray. Lord, what an awesome thing that you didn't keep secret your love to the world, but that you keep knocking on hearts and minds. You know the things that we're struggling with. You know the ways in which we want to see our lives grow and improve. And, and for those of us who are looking for some specific things to happen in this new year, give us, give us encouragement and strength to do things like quit smoking and, Jeff, get back to the gym and um, be more positive in our outlook and um, more encouraging to others or whatever it is in our life, Lord, that we like to see improvement in. Hey, give us strength to do that. But more than anything, Lord, help us to keep in mind that the most important thing is this relationship you have built with us through your Son, Jesus Christ. For there is your mercy, forgiveness, and hope. We commend to you this ministry for this coming year. Lord, help us be creative. Help us be daring. Help us be loving. Help us at times be quiet and listening. Help us to be open to your leading and the ideas of one another on ways in which we can open the door for community people around us to know you and your love. Thanks for this new year. Keep giving us conviction that you walk with us. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, how, did you bring kids back with you? He thinks they're coming. He's not really sure. How did it go? Awesome. That's great. I love it. What are we doing now? Offering and a song. Excellent.